I'm here to give you a presentation on the new forms of protectionism, uh, to discuss the, the manifestation of them, the scale of trade affected, and to summarize some of the econometric results of the impact of such protectionism on trade flows, especially as they relate to the European Union. I will also then draw out the policy implications. Now, the case that I want to make uh, to you could, come be, could be summarized as putting the current trade tensions in perspective. I am going to argue that President Trump has made overt the long-standing covert tendency of many governments to tilt the playing field in favor of their domestic commercial interests. So I'm going to argue, therefore, that uh, uh, Trump, is, uh, Trump is special because he has made it open, the protectionism and trade distortions, but he follows a long tradition of, uh, of governments since the onset of the global economic crisis tilting the playing field in favor of their domestic firms. So it's not just America first, it's other countries putting their own interests first as well. This you, some of you may find challenging, especially if you live in, uh, uh, an, uh, in a bubble where everything that's wrong with the world is the United States. The second uh, thing I will do then is to try and characterize the global protectionist dynamics that actually exist. So this will establish the factual base drawing on the global trade alert database, which is which I'll describe as well. Then we'll talk about the effects of trade distortions and I'll draw out the policy implications. So let's start uh, with a provocative question. Is this the most accurate way to characterize the current trade tensions? That essentially it is a US phenomenon, it is a 2018 phenomenon, and it is targeted, targeted principally at China. And, and uh, you can see that princi the principal instrument is tariffs. So for many, the bilateral tariff war is the defining event, uh, perhaps of the last 10 years in trade policy. It is when the wheels fell off the wagon. Uh, I want to challenge that view. And the way I'm going to do this is by drawing from a database uh, that uh, my team has assembled at the University of St. Gallen over the last 10 years. We look for any public policy intervention that changes the relative treatment of domestic versus foreign commercial interests. So a tariff reduction benefits foreign firms over domestic firms, and so we would count that. A tariff increase is the opposite. So they, all the traditional trade barriers will get identified by our work. We also look at uh, interventions which benefit uh, domestic firms at the expense of foreign firms, which come in the forms of subsidies and state largesse. So that gets added into our framework as well. And we look at things like local content requirements, government procurement uh, provisions, which bias contracts towards local firms like Buy America, and so on and so on. We do not include any uh, information on health and safety standards or anything like this, and we do not include any information on regional trading agreements, although some scholars regard those as discriminatory too. So our database then cover, goes well beyond tariffs and covers many of the non-tariff measures out there. And uh, the reason we had to construct this database is that no one else had. Countries since 1969 at the United Nations have said they're worried about non-tariff barriers. They just haven't done anything about collecting systematic data on it. Uh, and we use this crisis to uh, change that. We have documented over 16,000 policy changes. Our database on these policy changes is three times the size of that of the World Trade Organization. And our work is used extensively in research, and the IMF uh, gave us the seal of approval in 2016. So this is a database which uh, uh, we have uh, we will use. Now, the first thing I'm going to do in this database is to compare across years the number of harmful or discriminatory measures that we find in our database with the number of liberalizing measures. This is harder to do than you might think, because in 2018, we've had nine years to document uh, measures taken back in 2009 and 2010, and we've only had 11 months to document the measures in 2018. So you have to correct for the length of time that we've had to report. So what I did yesterday was to take the uh, total number of measures we've documented in each year from January the 1st of that year to the 18th of November of that year and compare them. So this compares apples with apples. It's a fair comparison of the uh, frequency of public policy intervention. And he, these are the global total, 
global totals, you can see that in 2009 to 2012, around 300 new trade distortions were added every year. And then from, 3000, uh, sorry, from 2012 to 2018, there has been a, an acceleration in the resort to trade distortions. So by 2018, over 900 public policy measures which distort trade have been introduced by the 18th of November of, uh, of this, the given year. The number of liberalizing measures is a fraction. It is increasing, which is good news, but the number of distortionary measures has risen much faster. I think the important implication here is that 2018 is bad. You can see the spike, uh, the growth, but the situation was deteriorating much before anyone ever heard of Donald Trump, uh, at least as a presidential candidate. So uh, the, our, sen our sense is that the focus on 2018 is important given how serious matters are, but uh, it would be wrong to uh, think of it as purely a phenomenon for this year. Now this, of course, just gives you the number of counts of measures. We might be interested in the amount of exports which are affected by uh, different types of trade distortions, or more precisely, the percentage of a country's exports which face trade distortions in overseas markets. And since we are at the Bavarian uh, representation, I chose to compute yesterday the data for Germany. And this chart shows you the percentage of German exports uh, which have faced new trade distortions implemented since the first G20 summit of November 2008. And you can see here in the orange line that very few German firms uh, or very, very little German exports, I should say, about 5% of them, have faced tariff increases, which are still in effect. Only 5% of German exports have faced a tariff increase, the 1930s style of protectionism. You can see that 16% of German exports competes in a foreign market against an, a domestic firm that has been bailed out. So this includes your Chinese subsidies, this includes your French subsidies, to bail out firms. This includes American subsidies to bail out firms. So one in six euros of German exports competes against a subsidized firm. And this is why some of us think the subsidy rules of the WGO need to be uh, looked into more carefully. But all of this pales into insignificance compared to one policy instrument which gets very little attention. Since the crisis began, a number of governments have, have offered greater and greater tax incentives to their firms to export. And that is what is captured in the light blue line, the share of German exports which compete in foreign markets against a rival who has received a tax break for exporting. So an example would be in the case of Brazil. Brazil offers up to a 3% tax rebate on any good which is exported. So if you earn 100 reals of export revenues, you can get three reals as a credit for any of your taxes in Brazil. This measure is an outright export subsidy. It has been challenged at the WTO, but still the Brazilians have this. Brazil is not alone in using such measures. China uses them, India uses them, South Africa uses them, other countries use them as well. And German exports compete against lots and lots of these subsidized exports. And Germany is not unusual in this respect. I can show you similar calculations for other countries. Overall, then, I estimate that just under 70% of German exports this year compete against a trade distortion in a foreign market uh, where that trade distortion has been created since the global economic crisis began. So my second piece of evidence, then, is that the scale of these export distortions are substantial much, much larger than you find in the WTO's reports. And that's because the WTO's reports only focus on the tariff increases and similar such measures. So there's a big difference between 5% and 70%. So that's the second piece of evidence for you. Now, this chart should make you think then about how do you, how do you uh, begin to understand the impact of trade distortions in the 21st century. For sure, we have measures which distort imports, reduce imports. For sure, we have subsidies at home which uh, shift market shares towards domestic firms away from foreign firms. But, but the big thing we need to figure out is what's the impact of all of these foreign, uh, or, or, sorry, all of these uh, distortions to exports, not just to imports. The 1930s mentality is to think that protectionism reduces imports. What we need to realize is that that dynamic is present. We see it in 2018. But we must also recognize that policies to distort exports also are a problem. Just to 
quickly summarize this. Our traditional way of thinking about uh, trade distortions is to think of an EU exporter shipping to an importer and the importer has a market access barrier like a tariff. This is uh, problematic. We, the second type of trade distortion we've often worried about is that if the importing country bails out import competing firms, this might limit the exports of an EU exporter. So that's problematic too. The third thing we have to worry about is that uh, there can be export incentives put in place by governments who are, uh, who are encouraging their exports. And there could be a third party, the other exporters here, who are promoting their exports through the use of tax incentives. And of course, if, if uh, China promotes the exports of it, its exports using tax breaks and a German firm competes against a Chinese firm in a foreign market, the German firm may lose market share. They may, may lose orders. So this ability of third-party export incentives to reshuffle exports is a key factor which we uh, think needs much more attention. So the bottom line then is that export distortions matter too. And uh, it's important that we do not fall into the 1930s mindset that only import restrictions matter. Distortions to exports matter as we learned uh, in agricultural trade many decades ago. There's another important implication here is that once you see that trade distortions can affect exports, then it's possible that if only a few countries use trade distortions on the export side, trade can be reshuffled, not necessarily reduced. So just because you didn't see global trade collapse after the global financial crisis did not mean there were not trade distortions. Most of the trade distortions were on the export side, not on the import side. And this is, where we, uh, this is where I think the factual record needs to be updated and some people's mental models of what, about what's gone on over the last 10 years revised. So one of the things my colleague uh, Johannes Fritz and I did was to study the relative impact of, or the impact of export incentives on extra EU exports. What we did was to compare extra uh, EU member state exports to the rest of the world, different destinations, with uh, the exports of China, Japan, and the United States. And we found that on average, between 2008 and 2013, the EU exports were on average 35% slower growing than the rival countries, China, Japan, and uh, the United States. We stripped out the drivers of relative export performance, differences in country size, membership of free trade agreements, distance, all the classic variables. And then we asked how much of the variation could be explained by different types of trade distortions. We did some uh, calculations uh, for three different counterfactuals. If, if the EU has exporters faced no trade distortion since the beginning of the crisis, and only the EU tr uh, exporters faced no trade distortions, so the other countries did, then we would see the performance gap Europe's export underperformance collapsed from 35.1% behind to just under 17% behind. Now, if you go to a second uh, uh, counterfactual, which is to ask what happens if all of the trade distortions since November 2008 never happened, so not just trade distortions harming the EU, trade distortions harming everyone, then you'll find, of course, that uh, our Chinese, Japanese, and uh, American rivals would have benefited from that free trade as well, uh, or at least the absence of protectionism. And so the performance gap for Europe contracts from being 35% behind on average to being 27.8% behind. So you can see a reduction in the Europe's underperformance. And last, the last counterfactual we did was, what happens if China removed all of its export incentives, um, which it uses quite extensively, and this too would have reduced the underperformance of the EU compared to the rest of the world by about 20%. So what our take on this is, is that EU export performance during the crisis era has been quite miserable. We document that in, a, uh, in, in the same study. And we would argue that EU export performance would have been faster in the absence of foreign trade distortions, or to put it differently, those trade distortions disproportionately harm the European Union compared to rivals like the, European, like the United States, Japan, and China. And so there is a major export reshuffling effect going on, which has been overlooked by much of the policy uh, discussion and debate. 
So that's the, so the third piece of evidence then is on the effects of trade, uh, trade distortions in the 21st century. So my case then has been, there has been quite a lot of resort to protectionism as shown by the counts. For countries like Germany and any other G20 country, the, a huge share of their exports is currently being distorted by trade distortions over the past 10 years. And we have now have the third piece of evidence <coughs> that, econometric ever, that uh, the econometric impact of those trade distortions is not trivial. That's the case that we're making. What can we draw from this in terms of policy implications? I want to start off with a, ho uh, uh, a hopeful um, a precedent which might be useful. And again, this is why I asked the question about history earlier to our colleague from DG Trade, because there are some very interesting history lessons. In the 1980s, one of the new forms of protectionism used was to ask countries to restrain their exports. Rather than hit them with tariffs, ask them to hold back on their exports. The big architect of that policy was a certain Mr. Robert Lighthizer. Heard of him? So that, he was the guy who came up with that policy. Now, of course, he's doing other things. Now, the Americans resorted to this policy a lot. There was a sharp global downturn. Rather than resort to import tariffs, which make you look like an unreconstructed protectionist, you use voluntary export restraints instead. And uh, at that time, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the Secretariat, did a good job of monitoring. They documented this, a coalition formed of uh, countries which have been harmed, and then in the Uruguay round, which was the, uh, started in 1986, getting rid of these voluntary export restraints was put on the agenda. So we have a deviation from the rules, monitoring, learning, and then agenda formation and eventual elimination in 1995 of these. So that's the positive precedent. Now the interesting question is whether as we build up more evidence on the impact of these new forms of protectionism, we will be able to repeat this, um, uh, the, repeat this precedent of going from bad behavior to new agenda of improved rules at the WTO. And of course much will turn on whether or not we think uh, that is viable. Now, the policy implications, and I seem to have lost my slide, but I'll read them to you anyway. Uh, the policy implications are as follows of my, of my presentation. First, protectionist pressure was building up well before anyone heard of America first. Okay, do not think that this is just a Trump phenomenon. Many countries have been breaking the rules. Trump is different because he's engaging in brazen, overt, blatant protectionism. Okay, many other countries have been using covert protectionism, uh, and covert protectionism is bad too. State aid, especially for our exporters, is probably one of the biggest areas we need to fix. It's an area where many countries are, have bad policies, and uh, this is an area we should focus on. The focus on either the United States or on China as the sole sources of trade tensions is misplaced. We have all been, many countries have been breaking the rules. Our data set shows this, and we ought to find a way to collectively address this. And since interest in reviving the WTO is high on the agenda, uh, then I think what we need to be able to do is to st take the type of evidence that myself and others have collected, identify the policies which have the largest negative cross-border spillovers, that's the cross-border harm, and then start constructing a WTO agenda which tackles that harm. That is the way forward. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Simon. We have two minutes for questions, so that's uh, courageous, but I still invite you. Uh, two questions. Daniel. Uh, Danny Gross from SEPS. Now we know from uh, general theory that an export uh, tariff is equivalent to an import tariff, and the same should matter also for export subsidies. So in a certain sense, these export subsidies we are observing should be fostering trade, not diminishing it. Let's collect, let's collect the second question. Uh, uh, there was one, uh, please. Lars <coughs> Ogilvy, formerly with the commission. The, you had a slide where you were saying in red that trade distortion, if you could bring that up. Yeah, equa equating trade distortions with reductions in trade is wrong. I, I agree with that. I don't understand the second part. And equating trade distortions with trade restrictions. 
Okay, this, these two questions are related. Absolutely, and Daniel is quite right to say that we have um, a lemma, an important theorem, which uh, says this. It's true that, imp that uh, export uh, subsidies could be the equivalent of import subsidies, but please remember here only some countries are using them. So the impact is going to be to reshuffle trade towards the countries which use these subsidies. It may well end up expanding their overall level of trade. And this brings me exactly to the point our colleagues here, which is that you know, as economists, we should worry about the distortion to trade, the distortion of resources, not the level of trade. And what we've had, it, when people came into this crisis, there was this mental model of too many policymakers, from Pascal Lamy down, that protectionism always reduced trade, and that's why it was wrong. And so what lots of governments did was they used policies that didn't reduce trade. They actually used policies that reshuffled trade. And that's the problem. So trade distortions don't have to be trade restrictions. Um, when, when we have countries subsidizing their exports of agricultural products, we all understood this was a trade distortion. All I'm asking you to do is to stick to that logic and apply it again in the 21st century. Uh, yes, also about, about these export numbers, which I found very interesting. My, my question is, uh, did you want to say this is bad for Europe or bad for anyone else? Because, uh, if I understand this correctly, the framework is, is one where you have a model and you have some distortions. And, uh, you know, if you have pre-existing distortions, nobody knows whether exporting less or more is better. Could you... That's right. So what, what we, I mean, what we can study, of course, is the observed uh, trade flows and their changes. And so we uh, use a framework which looks at bilateral trade flow growth and, and the comparison between the EU, an EU member state and, uh, and, and a third country. And we essentially were looking at to what extent were patterns of export growth distorted by these different policy interventions. Right? Now that, the, you know, the mapping from trade to welfare, we can talk about and, and, and get into, but at least from a trade policy point of view, they do worry about that type of beggar thy neighbor activity, and I would argue probably for good reason, although, as I said, the, you know, the theoretical link between the level of trade and welfare is something one could go into much more carefully. Very good. Uh, thank you. I'm sorry we need to, to move on. We have uh, four, four uh, papers. Hülke van den Busche, Löwen, the next. <laughs>